So it says, are we going to talk about the elephant in the room? Uh, the elephant in the room refers to a major controversial problem that everybody knows about, but no one wants to discuss. Like you're 45 and still single and your parents are gone. Or your parents hate your new boyfriend. Or you're a strong supporter of President Obama and your friend voted for President Trump. Or you have an addiction and everybody's kind of walking on eggshells around you wondering if you're going to fall off the wagon. I believe the elephant in the room topic in every church is facing our fears of generosity. I mean, every pastor talks about the subject at some point. The Bible's filled with calls to be generous. Solomon writes in Proverbs 11, one person gives freely, yet gains even more. Another withholds unduly, but comes to poverty. A generous person will prosper. Whoever refreshes others will be refreshed. So these are promises about generosity. Apostle Paul writes, Remember this, whoever sows sparingly will also reap sparingly. Whoever sows generously will also reap generously. Now he who supplies seed to the sower and bread for food will also supply and increase your store of seed and will enlarge the harvest of your righteousness. You'll be enriched in every way so that you can be generous on every occasion. He suggests that the more generous you are in giving to God, the more he provides you so you can be generous to still others. And through us, your generosity will result in thanksgiving to God. So all these verses say, give generously and God will provide for you. Don't hoard. Don't not give. Don't be stingy. An Arab sheikh was uh, checked into the hospital to uh, have uh, open heart surgery. And before they could proceed, the doctor uh, needed to have uh, some of his blood on hand if it was needed and he had a very rare blood type so they couldn't find it locally so the call went out all around the world eventually they found a Scotsman who had the same rare blood type after some coaxing he uh, agreed to donate his blood for the Arab Sheik well after the surgery the Arab Sheik sent him a brand new BMW uh, diamond necklace for his wife and a hundred thousand dollars in cash well, a few months later, the uh, sheik had to go in for corrective surgery, and the doctor called the Scotsman again if he would donate blood, and this time he was more than happy to donate blood. After the surgery, the uh, Arab sheik sent him a thank you card and a, uh, a box of quality uh, street chocolates. The Scotsman was just shocked that he wasn't uh, as generous as he had anticipated. So he called him up. He says, hey, last time you gave me a BMW, a, a necklace, and money. This time you gave me a lousy card and a crummy box of chocolates. What's the deal? And the Arab sheik responded, hey, laddie, now I have Scottish blood in me veins. <laughs> <clears throat> God calls us to give generously, and he makes all kinds of promises. But the elephant in the room is facing our fears of generosity. So if God calls us to give generously and promises to bless us in amazing ways, when we do, why doesn't everyone give and give readily? George Barner tells us, religious pollster, among adults who attend church regularly, an average of at least once a month, more than one out of three, 37%, did not give any money to a church in the past year. They didn't give a dime. One third of board and gang Christians do not give money to their churches. What's wrong here? With God's instructions and promises concerning generosity, why doesn't everybody give and give generously? I've thought about this quite a bit, and I believe there are two main reasons we're afraid to give generously. One, we're afraid we won't be able to meet our other obligations. We think, if I give to God, how will I pay my alimony, my child support, my credit card, my car payment, the furniture payment, the uh, cell phone or cable company or the line of credit or the mortgage. So how did we get this way? How did so many of us get so deep in debt that we feel like we cannot be generous with God? 
A generation or two, our grandparents practiced a principle called delayed gratification. If you can't afford to buy something, you save up. Otherwise, you delay gratification, and when you have enough, then you buy it. We ignored, or some of us never were taught, two principles in the Bible about delayed gratification. Save and spend within your means. Here's a little bit of what the Bible says about saving. In the house of the wise are stores of choice food and oil, but a foolish man devours all he has. It's not wise to spend every penny you earn. Solomon writes, Go to the ant, you sluggard. Consider its ways and be wise. It has no commander, no overseer or ruler. Yet it soars its provisions in summer and gathers its food at harvest. It's not prudent to not have savings. So you're not ready for lean years. When you save, you pay yourself. You worked hard. You deserve a wage. Every month after you pay God, take another 10% and pay yourself. You put it in long-term savings and let it build. This isn't a mad money fund. This isn't a vacation fund. This is your freedom fund. As your investment builds up, you're not only working, but you have money working for you. Some people have no money working for them. I heard last week that if someone came and said, I need $400 from you on the table right now, the majority of Americans could not do it. There are millions of people who work their whole lives but end up penniless because they never paid themselves. That's not wise. Now, if you have a lot of debt, before you can do long-term savings, you have to use your 10% saving money to pay down your debt. And then once you do that, your first priority is to set up your rainy day fund. That's to get you through a crisis. You get sick and can't work. Uh, uh, you, you lose your job. It's to carry you through three to six months. A wise financial advisor once said there are two kinds of people in the world. There are people who make interest and people who pay interest. You have to decide which kind of person you want to be. Jory and I decided we wanted to be people who make interest. So, working hard and being frugal and with help from our parents, we felt fortunate to both get through college and graduate school debt-free. Then we decided we never wanted to pay interest on credit cards. We would pay it off uh, each month. And that we'd always save up for purchases for anything where the, uh, the value is going down. So for, for cars or furniture or jewelry, anything like that, we'd save up before we buy. The second biblical principle is spend within your means. You have to wait to buy certain things. You have to save up money before you buy. And most people, up until about 30 or 40 years ago, lived this way. Most of our grandparents lived this way. But sometime, uh, somewhere along the way, things changed in our country. Credit cards got so easy to get. It kind of works like magic. You can reach into the future, grab a handful of money, pull it into the present, and spend it. It's amazing. I mean, you can reach into the future, get a fistful of money, spend now to buy something that you couldn't have afforded otherwise. It's so cool. Our whole country started thinking this way. Even our leaders. I couldn't believe it last week. Nick Melvaney presented Congress with a, a budget that would, would be a balanced budget within 10 years. You'd think people would say, wow, finally, some sanity. But instead, some leaders said, this is shameful. This is immoral. We have so many things in our budget and so, uh, and so many people in our budget that we can't afford and programs that don't even be, seem to be working that when somebody suggests, why don't we take some of those out, they're told that they're immoral. Nobody talks about being immoral to put up debt for our children and our grandchildren. I mean, at your house and my house, you have to balance your budget. Everybody understands if you run out of money, you have to quit spending, right? But our country doesn't do that. We just keep borrowing so we can just keep spending. 
Now, God talked about this a long time ago. It's actually amazing how much God has to say about money in the Bible. Deuteronomy 28, The Lord will open the heavens, the storehouse of His bounty, to send rain on your land in season and to bless all the work of your hands. You will lend to many nations, but will borrow from none. He says, The evidence that I am blessing you as a nation is that you will have margin. Surrounding nations will come to you to get loans. They will pay you interest, but you will not borrow from other nations and pay interest. Wealthy nations loan money, right? Andy Stanley, in his book, How to Be Rich, talks about the fact that somewhere, sometime back, we had an attitude flip in our country. Borrowing became an acceptable thing to do. If you were rich and had good income... You could leverage that money and borrow so you could buy bigger houses and more stuff. The borrowing frenzy has caused even the rich to have a hard time holding on to their money. Sports Illustrated says an amazing 78% of NFL players within two years of leaving the NFL are bankrupt. And 60% of NBA players, uh, they're... You know, all the huge contracts they get? 60% within five years of leaving the court are broke. I mean, how does that happen? They borrow so much that when their income stops, they go belly up. Soon we had the upper class, the upper middle class, the middle class, and eventually the lower middle class all getting stuff with credit. The economy was fueled by signing more and more people up for credit. So then some really smart people thought, okay, we've got the upper middle class, we've got, uh, we got, we got the upper class, we've got the upper middle class, we've got the middle class, we've got the upper, you know, uh, the lower, whatever, lower middle class. <laughs> Who else can we get? Well, we still don't have the young and the poor. Uh, how can we get them? So they thought about some ideas, and they said, okay, we can get the young by having them take out loans for college and graduate school, and they'll have loans forever, like, you know? And then, of course, we can get them credit cards, make it really easy for them to get credit cards. I heard uh, just this week that there are so many students so buried in college and graduate school loans that there are a million students on one website that will sell themselves to uh, pay off their loans. We have kids that are willing to go into prostitution to pay off their loans that have them buried. So I already mentioned the other strategy is to get kids on credit cards, and uh, uh, Erica gets uh, credit card uh, offers all the time. You know, hey, you're pre-approved. Does she look like somebody that's pretty, pretty good to pay off her, her card each month? I mean, it is nuts. But how do we get the poor? And then they came up with this brilliant idea of what we call subprime loans. A subprime loan is a loan offered at a rate. Wait, sub is supposed to be under. But they came up with a subprime loan that was above prime rate. That means it's more expensive than the average loan to individuals who do not qualify for prime rate loans. What? Yeah, see, there are people who are too poor to get into debt, and we thought that's not fair. Rich people are in debt. Poor people need to be in debt. That's not fair. Old people have debt. Young people need to have debt. And these Young, poor people, all they have is credit card debt. That's not fair. They should get to have housing debt like everybody else. But since they don't qualify for normal loans because it's too risky, I know, let's charge them higher rates to get into homes they probably can't afford. And so because of subprime loans, it was such a brilliant idea that at the end of the day we had everybody from the rich to the poor in debt and then the music stopped most experts say the final straw that led to the recession in 2008 was the 
housing collapse. So many people could not pay their loans that all these homes were being foreclosed. But the problem is, here we are nine years later, and it's not clear that anybody learned anything. Most of us are still in so much debt that we're afraid that if we give, we won't have enough to cover our obligations. Parents, teach your children these principles while they're young of saving and spending within their means. Don't let them impulsively buy anything that they want. And whatever you do, when they want something, don't throw it on your credit card. Pay them an allowance. Uh, you know, pay them to do jobs around the house and have them save up to buy something that they want. There's a second fear that keeps us from giving generously to God. We're afraid God doesn't love us enough to keep his promises to provide for us. Giving sounds counterintuitive. If you're maxed out financially, giving doesn't sound like the smartest thing to do. If we give generously, we have a hard time believing that God will meet our needs and enable us to meet our other obligations. Over and over again, God in his word says, if we give him the first part of our income, he will provide for us. Let's look at God's instructions concerning generous giving and his promises. The authors of the Bible teach that every time you get your paycheck, there are two entities that are to be paid every time. The second is yourself. You save money just to let it build up. You also save to buy things you cannot currently afford. The first entity you pay is God. You take the first 10% out of your paycheck right off the top and give it back to God. Proverbs 3.9 says, Honor the Lord with your wealth with the first fruits of all your crop. You give to God first. Leviticus 27 says, A tithe of everything belongs to the Lord. Deuteronomy 14, Be sure to set aside a tenth of all that your fields produce each year. Malachi cries, Bring the whole tithe into the storehouse. Jesus carries this principle into the New Testament in Matthew 23, 23, when he says, talking about tithing, this you ought to have done. He tells us to continue the practice of tithing. The tithe is kind of the basic standard for Christians. Now, if you're up to your eyeballs in debt, you may have to downsize this percentage and work toward 10%. Maybe you have to start at 4% or 5% or 6%. But you want to at least understand the principle and at least get started in the practice of when you get paid, the first person you pay is God. Almost every time God discusses giving or generous giving or tithing in the Bible, he attaches a promise to it. Solomon says, honor the Lord with your wealth, with the first fruits of all your crops, then your barns will be filled to overflowing and your vats will brim over with new wine. There's the promise. Jesus says, give, and it will be given to you. A good measure, pressed down, shaken together, running over, will be poured into your lap. For with the measure you use, it will be measured to you. By tithing, you're saying to God that you're going to obey Him in this area and trust that He'll take care of you financially. God feels so strongly about this that in Malachi, He says, bring the whole tithe into the storehouse, test me. In this, and see if I will not throw open the floodgates of heaven, pour out so much blessing that you will not have room enough for it. He says, try it. And if I don't honor you back, then bail. Test me. God says, if I don't become supernaturally involved in your finances, to cap off the grand truth of the tithe, God makes an incredible promise. He says, I will prevent pests from devouring your crops. And the vines in your fields will not cast their fruit, says the Lord Almighty. If we let go and give generously to God, God says He will make it His mission to rebuke the forces that chew up our finances. Breakdowns, repairs, sudden sickness, the stove or the furnace goes pop. Now don't misunderstand what I'm saying. I'm not saying if you give generously to God, you'll never have anything go wrong. But if we depart from the Lord's ways and neglect His life-nourishing principles of giving, we choose to step out from underneath God's umbrella of blessing. 
without His protection, we're far more vulnerable to reign of problems. It's been my experience since I began the practice of tithing in high school that God always keeps His promises. I know thousands of Christians who say, I would never run my finances a a different way. Jeff Mannion in his book, Satisfied, tells about an experience of firsthand seeing God provide. His parents felt called by God to move to plant a church in southeast Idaho. Now that's Mormon country. Very difficult place to plant a church. So they didn't have anybody, so they really didn't have any financial resources, so they had to pray and depend on God for each step of building that church and even to meet their own financial needs. Well, one day Jeff's uh, dad came home from the church office and his mom was crying. He said, honey, what's wrong? She said, we have all these expenses before school starts and we don't have any money. She says, I added them all up. I've got school supplies, I got school clothes, I got medical costs, I got groceries, and I've got stuff we just need for around the house. It's $727. How are we going to do that? And so they got down on their knees together and they prayed and they said, God, we don't have that money, but we don't think these are frivolous things and you've promised to provide for us and so we look to you and we're just counting on you to, you can do it in a lot of different ways, we know that. And then the, his father went to, to get the mail and uh, there was only one letter. It was from a family in California that he knew, but he had never met. And he opened it up, and it, was, it said, we sold one of our businesses for $7,270. And uh, we want to tithe on it, and we felt impressed by God that we should give it to you. So in it was a check for $727. That was the exact amount his mom and dad had got on their knees and prayed for. To give and trust God is always an enterprise of faith. Elijah was an Old Testament prophet to to Israel. And Elijah challenged Ahab, the king, and his wife Jezebel, and the 450 prophets of Baal. He says, it will not rain in Israel except when God says it will, by my voice. And then he left. And it didn't rain for months and months and years. And he was the most wanted man in Israel. They looked for him everywhere. God was taking care of him by a brook called Kareth. And uh, uh, a raven would bring him meat every morning to eat. Well, after three years, you know, it was so dry that the brook at Kareth was drying up. And Elijah says, hey, God, it's only a couple puddles here. What are we going to do? And God says, I've directed a widow to take care of you. In Zarephath. So Elijah got up and he went to Zarephath and he pictured a well-to-do widow, a well-heeled. And outside the gate he saw a woman picking up sticks. And he said to her, Would you bring me a little water in a jar so I may have a drink? That seems like a fair request. So as she went off to get him a drink of water, he said, And would you bring me a piece of bread to eat? Now, in a time of famine when nobody has anything and all the crops have died and all of Israel's going down the drain economically, maybe that's not a reasonable request. And sure enough, the, world, the woman whirled around in one of the most pathetic confessions in all the Bible. She says, as surely as your God lives, I don't have any bread, only a handful of flour in a jar and a little olive oil in a jug. I'm gathering a few sticks to take home, make a meal for myself and my son that we may eat it, and die. I'm going to have, we're going to have our final meal tonight, and then we're going to starve to death. Now, you would think this would be the time Elijah would say, oh, I am so, I am so sorry. I obviously got the wrong widow. Please forgive me. But instead, he says, don't be afraid. Go home and do as you have said. But first make a small loaf of bread for me from what you have and bring it to me and then make something for yourself and your son. 
For this is what the Lord, the God of Israel, says. The jar of flour will not be used up. The jug of oil will not run dry until the day the Lord sends rain on the land. So, at that point, we kind of expect she's going to whirl around and say, what do you take me for, an idiot? I'm going to make you the last bit of food I have for you. And... But instead we read, she went away and did as Elijah had told her. Whoa, what's up with that? Why did she just do it? Remember now, God had told Elijah, I have directed a widow to take care of you. So she had some inside information. I, I take it that God talked to her and said, hey, this prophet's going to come and is going to ask you something outlandish. Whatever he asks you to do, do it. So now she had a decision to make. Do I do what God told me to do? Do I do what Elijah asked me to do? Or do I say, forget it, I'm not being stupid. And she chose faith. To believe God's promise. And so we read, So there was food every day for Elijah and for the woman and her family, for the jar of flour was not used up, and the jug of oil did not run dry, in keeping with the word of the Lord spoken by Elijah. Huh. She goes off and gets the wood. She builds a fire. She takes her last bit of flour and oil and water. Makes it for Elijah. That God delights at seeing people with courageous faith. When you give and you don't know how you're going to meet your other obligations, God delights to keep his promises. If you say, I'll start giving when I've got the school loans paid off. I'll start giving when we get these debts down. I'll start giving when we've got a rainy day fin up and strong. You're basically saying, I'll give as soon as I don't have to give by faith. I know some of you are underemployed. You're just squeaking by. Others of you have ample income, but because you have so many debts, you, you just don't have anything left over at the end of the month to give to God. And you're wondering in your situation, should I give? Does it make sense? I urge you to give generously to God like Jeff Mannion's parents, like the widow at Zarephath, and trust that he will keep his promise. Parents, talk to your kids about giving while they're young. George and my parents talked to us about tithing on our allowance, on anything we earned around the house. So when we got married, it wasn't even a discussion. We had lived that way for years. And I'll tell you, God has been so good. We have given 10%, I think, you know, a range to, to maybe 22% in all years of marriage, and God has been so good to us. Now, I'd be guilty of spiritual malpractice if I told you these biblical principles today but I didn't ask you to make a decision about them if what I've talked about today leave, leaves you feeling unsure about what to do next I urge you choose faith so let me repeat what I've said today one save few things can be more disconcerting make you feel more out of control than unforeseen expenses you can't afford. Don't be caught off guard. Like the ant, set aside a part. Are you ready to say that? Two, spend within your means. Financial patterns are frequently passed down from one generation to the next, but you don't need to pass them along. Someone has to stop the financial insanity let that somebody be you. No more living beyond God's provision. Say, I'm not going to raise my lifestyle level through debt. Are you ready to say that? Three, give generously. I honor God by giving the first tenth of what I earn to His kingdom causes. 
Now, I am so confident in God's promises. It's been lived out so much in joys in my life that we're offering you today a three-month tithe challenge. If you've never done this before, for three months you can say, okay, God, I'm going to give you the first tenth of what I earn. And we feel so strongly about God's promises that in three months, if you don't feel like God has stretched your remaining money and helped you meet all your other obligations, you can just write me an email and say, I want all my money back and we'll give it back. That's the deal. You can sign up for it on our communication card or you can go to our website, portlandcommunitychurch.org and it leads you through how to do that. Just press give it and it leads you through that. That's the deal. Let's pray. Father, thank You for Your offer, <coughs> Your challenge to give generously. And we all have our reasons why we are afraid to do that because we have so many other expenses. But You're challenging us today to trust You anyway and invite You to be supernaturally involved in our finances. So I want to give you a moment to talk to God. If you've felt challenged today, convicted maybe, why don't you tell God that? Maybe, you, maybe you're ready to take the, the tithe challenge and uh, you uh, tell Him you want to you wanna try that and, uh, for three months. Or you want to say, uh, God, I can't start there. Maybe I'll do 5%. But whatever it is, you, you start the journey and uh, uh, tell Him that. Or whatever you got out of this sermon, you, you, you tell Him right now. Everybody pray. Thank you, Father, for speaking through your word. Thank you that your word is true. We can build our lives around it, put our faith in it, in you. In Jesus' name we pray.